Today, I'm going to explain a crime mystery film called Double Jeopardy. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. Libby Parsons is a mother who loves nothing more than spending time with her four-year-old son, Maddie. They like to do things together, including fishing. Libby teaches her son how to use a fishing rod, and as she does, she points to a boat across the sea, the Morning Star. She tells him that it's the prettiest boat on the island. Libby also adds that she'll someday teach Maddie how to sail. According to Libby, sailing is better than fishing. She tells Maddie that she doesn't want him to grow up because he'll marry some girl, and no one will sail with Libby anymore. At their residence, Nick throws a party that most of his friends and co-workers attend. Two of his colleagues try to talk to him about work, specifically about Seattle, but he avoids them as he clearly doesn't want to talk. Meanwhile, Libby's best friend, Angela, hands Maddie over to her and Libby asks if she's been carrying Maddie around the whole time. Angela says yes to this, and Libby tells her that they're never marrying her off. As the party continues, Nick sees some of his guests admiring one of his paintings. He overhears their conversation as a guy explains to his lady friend that one of the paintings is made by Picasso. Ever the art enthusiast, Nick corrects the man, explaining that the painting is actually made by a German artist named Vasily Kandinsky. After that, Nick goes outside to where most of his guests are to make a speech. He thanks everyone for coming, announcing that the party's purpose is to raise money for the small fry school. Angela remarks that Nick is insufferable, and Libby agrees with her. After the party, Libby, Nick, and Angela are left at home, and Nick talks about breaking some news to Libby. When Libby asks what's going on, Nick tells her to close her eyes. The two playfully dance around, and when Angela asks Libby what her favorite thing is, Nick finally tells her to open her eyes. And the first thing she sees is the morning star, smoothly sailing across the waters. According to Nick, the boat's owner is thinking of selling it and has agreed to lend it to them for the weekend. Angela offers to take care of Maddie since Libby is worried about him, still trying to wrap her head around Nick's plan, Libby teases her husband that he hates to sail. Nick only smiles at her, saying that he can learn. As planned, Nick and Libby take out the boat with Libby navigating it. When Nick comes out of the boat's compartment, he is surprised that he can't see the land. When Libby asks where he wants to go, Nick replies that he wants to go to bed so they spend the night in each other's arms. While in bed, Libby suggests to Nick that they should go away more often and Nick agrees before tenderly kissing her. A few moments have passed, and Libby must have fallen asleep before waking to a loud, banging sound. Wondering why her husband isn't in bed, Libby calls out to Nick. Just as she does, Libby notices that her clothes and hands are all covered with blood. Frightened, Libby continues calling Nick, who's still nowhere to be found. When Libby leaves their room, she sees blood painting the walls, the floor, and even the stairs leading to the upper deck. She spots some bloody footprints which end by the rails. If that were Nick's blood, he might very well have gone overboard. Libby continues to search for her husband. Eventually, she stumbles upon a knife on the floor. She picks it up and as if on cue, the Coast Guard patrol arrives only to be greeted by the sight of a confused woman on deck with a bloody knife in her hands. The search for Nick begins, and the local media starts to cover their story. Libby's cop friend, Cutter, coordinates with the authorities regarding Nick's case. According to him, the life preservers are still on board. Cutter also adds that the rescuers have already tracked the wind and currents but they still haven't found any signs of Nick. He adds that the water temperature that night was too cold, implying that her husband couldn't have survived. Suddenly, Libby starts hyperventilating and Cutter holds onto her, trying to calm her down and make sure she's alright. One day, as Libby watches her son play by the shore, Cutter and his fellow policemen show up. Libby's lawyer friend Bobby is also with them and he informs Libby that an inquest was held that morning. Nick has been officially declared dead. It pains Bobby to tell her this but while Nick was considered to have a wrongful death, the authorities have formally charged her with his murder. Before she can respond, Bobby advises her to withhold from making any statements to the sheriff. Cutter apologizes to Libby before taking out the handcuffs. Libby firmly tells him not to put them on her in front of Maddie. Libby is taken to jail, and as she waits, Bobby arrives to tell her that they've been denied bail. He asks Libby if Angela can take care of Maddie, and Libby only responds by nodding. Bobby is preparing to tell Libby what they can do about her case, but Libby cuts him off. She starts telling him about what could have happened that night. Libby remembers having some wine before falling asleep. She says that Nick might have been trying to cut a snagged line as the knife was on deck. Libby tearfully adds that the boat might have pitched and he ended up cutting himself. She proposes that he must have tried going downstairs to wake her up. When Libby looks at Bobby, his face is unreadable. He holds her hand, assuring her that everything will be alright. Returning to what they're supposed to discuss, Bobby brings up that Nick and Libby bought life insurance policies four months ago, to which she is the beneficiary. Libby curtly replies that she's Nick's wife, so Bobby asks her if she knows that the policy is worth $2 million. Libby tells Bobby that Nick wanted to make sure that his wife and son would be okay in the event that something happened to him. Bobby is quick to answer that the jury might see this as a motive to kill Nick. Libby asks him if people are saying that she killed Nick for money, and Bobby answers that nobody's saying that. Libby starts to get hysterical, making Bobby lightly raise his voice. Finally, he admits that two of Nick's investors were suing him for embezzlement. He says that Seattle has issued a lien on all of Nick's real estate properties and her possessions. This means that Nick's death will make his problems disappear behind a corporate shield, which will leave Libby with $2 million. In court, the prosecution asks the officer assigned to Nick's case about the boat's marine band radio when they inspected it. He says that the handset cord was cut, and that they saw Libby holding a knife as they approached the Morning Star. 
After the officer's statement, the prosecution shows the court the bloody knife from the scene and plays a recording of Nick's voice. Based on the recording, Nick was able to call for help. When the operator asked what his emergency was, he said that he'd been stabbed and that he was bleeding. The operator asked for his location, but Nick wasn't sure, so he just estimated where they were before he started bawling. After playing the recording, Prosecutor Hallowell cross-examines Libby, trying to discredit what she previously said that somebody must have come aboard their boat. The prosecutor mocks Libby by saying that aliens must have murdered her husband but then takes it back. Aliens weren't the beneficiary of Nick's life insurance policy. Bobby, tries to object, but the judge overrules this. Prosecutor Hallowell continues her assault on Libby, saying that Libby must have been sleepwalking when she stabbed Nick. Finding it hard to contain her emotions, Libby breaks down, insisting that she didn't kill her husband and pleading to the jury to believe her. After losing the case, Bobby apologizes to Libby, but Libby tells him that it's not his fault. Once he leaves, Libby turns to Angela, and asks her to adopt Maddie. She refuses, saying she can't do that to Libby, but Libby is adamant about it. Libby barely survived her parents' house so there's no way she'll put her son there. Libby also adds that Maddie won't be a problem because Nick's life insurance will be transferred to him. After some convincing, Angela finally agrees and Libby thanks her best friend profusely. Libby pulls her son to her lap and tells him that he'll be staying with Angela for a while. She does her best to keep herself from crying in front of Maddie and promises him that once everything is over, they'll be together again. In prison, Libby meets two inmates who bet that Libby won't last long and that she might even kill herself. Libby tells them to stay away from her, but they say that they heard about what she did to her husband and that he probably deserved it. Libby tries to adjust to her new life, and the frequent visits from Maddie and Angela are the main thing that keeps her going. Eventually, Maddie and Angela stop visiting, and no matter how much Libby calls her, she gets no answer. One day, the two inmates from before notice that she's alone and in deep thought, so they approach her, telling her that they know she's looking for her friend and son. Libby says that they disappeared, but one of them insists that she can figure out how to find them if she just used her head. By posing as Angela and calling Maddie school, Libby is finally able to track down where Angela is, which is in San Francisco. Libby immediately calls the number and when Angela answers, she immediately asks if Maddie's okay. Angela stammers, saying that everything is fine, but Libby continues questioning her, asking her what they're doing in San Francisco and why they suddenly disappeared. Angela says that she's just about to call Libby and that they're planning to see her the following week. Tired of Angela's excuses, Libby demands to talk to Maddie, and while they talk, Libby hears Maddie call his father. The line suddenly goes dead, and Libby tries calling them again to no avail. One day, one of Libby's new friends, Margaret, tells her to forget about reopening her case. She says they take years and most of them are unsuccessful. Being a former lawyer, Margaret advises her to do her time instead, then asks if Libby has ever heard about double jeopardy. When Libby says no, Margaret explains that the double jeopardy rule provides that no person may be tried for the same crime twice. Since the state has already convicted Libby of killing her husband, it means they can't convict her of it a second time. It also means that once Libby gets out, she can track Nick down and kill him. Learning about the double jeopardy clause, Libby spends most of her free time in prison, training and getting strong. After six years, Libby is paroled due to her good behavior, but she has to live in a halfway house under parole officer Travis Lehman's supervision. In there, Lehman reminds Libby that the state has only granted her conditional parole, meaning that for the next three years, she needs to follow all the facility's rules. He gives her a social security card for employment then tells her that she's not allowed to carry a weapon of any kind. After informing her what time the curfew is, Lehman gives Libby his number, telling her not to lose it. Lastly, Lehman reminds Libby that violating any of the rules might result in her imprisonment again. With the help of some random guy in a library, Libby tries searching for Angela's new address on the internet. Unfortunately, there are more than a thousand Angela Greens in the search results, making her impossible to find. One day, a fight breaks between one of the parolees and Lehman in the house. After it was resolved, the other parolees get to talking. That's when Libby finds out that Lehman used to be a law professor who got in an accident due to intoxication. His wife and child have also left him. In another attempt to find Angela, Libby talks to Rebecca, Maddie's former headmistress. Libby tells her that she's her only hope, but Rebecca says that she can't help Libby. She also adds that Maddie hasn't seen her in six years, and if she suddenly comes back into her son's life, she'll just cause him more pain. No matter how hard Libby pleads with Rebecca, the headmistress remains unmoved. That night, Libby violates her curfew and breaks into Maddie's old school to get Angela's contact information. Libby manages to get Angela's records, but the cops catch her. Layman eventually picks her up. As he delivers Libby back to prison aboard a car ferry, he handcuffs her to the car's handle to get coffee. Thinking she can escape, Libby drives the vehicle back and forth, repeatedly hitting a pipe until she breaks the handle. Layman finally sees what she's doing, but when he gets in the car, it falls off the ferry. Layman is still able to save Libby, but during the process, she gets a hold of his gun and hits him in the head before finally escaping. Libby then visits her mother, who gives her some cash and even lends Libby her truck. At a car dealership, Libby poses as Angela again and uses her social security number to find out where Angela leaves. Lehman manages to track where Libby is going by asking one of his parolees to do a search on Angela Green. Libby drives to Colorado and there she discovers from a neighbor that Angela, who's known there as Angela Ryder, has died in an explosion four years ago. 
Libby asks the neighbor about Maddie and the neighbor says that Maddie and Simon, which is presumably Nick's new identity, weren't there when it happened. Meanwhile, Layman is only a few steps behind Libby, and he's able to interview the same person Libby has asked about Angela. After talking to Angela's neighbor, Libby searches the internet again for news about Angela's death. In the picture, she sees a painting of Kandinsky that Nick owns. By going to an art gallery, Libby's able to trace the painting to New Orleans. She finds out that Nick is running a small luxury hotel there under his new name, Jonathan Devereaux. Layman has only missed her by a few minutes, so he asks the art curator what Libby was looking for in the gallery. Libby looks for the hotel Nick is running, asks for Jonathan Devereaux, then finds out that he will be at the annual bachelor's auction. At the hotel, Libby hears one of the guests' personal information and uses that to buy a dress, saying she'll charge it to her room. Layman, who is also in New Orleans now, coordinates with the police to find Libby, saying that she might kill someone. At the event, Libby joins the bidding when it's Nick's turn to be auctioned and she eventually wins. When she comes forward to claim her prize, Nick is surprised to see her. She humiliates him in front of everyone by asking for a kiss, only to turn away as soon as he's about to give her one. As they walk away, Libby doesn't beat around the bush and threatens to destroy Nick's life if he doesn't give her Maddie. Nick makes the excuse of protecting her and Maddie by getting the life insurance since they were going under. He adds that he never believed that Libby was going to be convicted anyway. Nick tries to tell her that his relationship with Angela happened later and that it turned out to be a complete nightmare, but Libby doesn't believe him. She even asks if that's why Nick killed her but he insists that it's an accident. Libby is having none of it and she once again demands that he give her Maddie. After a heated discussion, Libby sees Layman approaching and tells Nick that she'll call him the following day. Layman talks to Nick, who he thinks is named John Devereaux, and asks if he has seen Libby. Layman tells him that she believes him to be her husband, but Nick pretends to be clueless. Layman also informs him that Libby is looking for him, so Nick thanks him for his concern, adding that he'll contact their security. At a bar, one man recognizes Libby from the flyers that the cops have been passing around. Instead of turning her in, he advises her to leave immediately and even gives her an umbrella. With the cops surrounding the area, Libby tries to escape again by carefully blending with the crowd. Luckily, she's able to hide, and the cops just let it go. The following morning, Layman meets up with Nick to inform him that Libby got away. Spotting the paintings on the wall, Layman asks Nick if his kids painted them, but Nick says they're made by a great artist named Kandinsky. After answering the officer's question, Nick adds that he has a feeling that Layman already knew that. While they're talking, Libby calls and tells Nick to bring Maddie to Lafayette Cemetery No. 3. However, Nick hires a boy to pretend to be Maddie to lure Libby into a mausoleum. In there, Nick attacks her and locks her inside a coffin. Back at the police station, Layman uses their system to search for Jonathan Devereaux nothing came up. He then requests the Washington State DMV to fax him the driver's license photograph of Nicholas Parsons. Back at the mausoleum, Libby escapes by using Layman's gun to shoot the coffin's hinges. Upon getting the driver's license, Layman sees that the man in the photograph is a different man from Libby's husband. Feeling that Libby might go to see Nick, Layman beats her to the hotel and stops her, making Libby break down. Layman meets up with Nick again and informs him that after asking the Washington State DMV for Nicholas Parsons' driver's license photograph, six different men with that name came up. One of them is him, Jonathan Devereaux. Layman pretends to ask Nick for a million dollars as hush money, but Nick says he can only give him a hundred thousand at the moment before promising that he can provide the rest tomorrow. When Layman says that Libby is still going to be a problem, Nick hints that he's already killed her. At that moment, Libby enters the room with a gun in hand. Nick warns her that if she shoots him, she'll get the gas chamber. Libby confidently replies that due to the double jeopardy clause, she won't be convicted of killing him now since she was already convicted of that before. Libby asks Nick where Maddie is, and as soon as Nick tells her, she shoots the Kandinsky painting behind him. Layman then reveals that he's been recording their conversation and that he will be charged with Libby's supposed murder. As Layman and Libby are leaving, Nick shoots them, hitting Layman in the shoulder. Though he's injured, Layman manages to tackle Nick, but Nick still gets the upper hand. Just as Nick stands and prepares to kill Layman, Libby shoots him twice, finally killing him. Libby tells Layman that she's leaving, but Layman convinces her to go back with him to Seattle, where he will demand a full pardon for her. At last, Libby goes to Maddie's new school, and even though he's aged six years, Maddie immediately recognizes his mother. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.